Yeah. Hi, Brooke. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yep. Need to can hear you. Here. Okay. Is yeah. So we're, we're going to get the talk up here in a second. Can you see my title there now? Hello. Yep. The tw yep. The slides are up. It's great. Okay. Should we go ahead and start? Uh, yes. Okay. Hi, good morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, uh, this is Pat Cullen with the Coral Reef Research Foundation in Koror Palau. Um, I wanted to tell you about something new that we've started doing uh, over the last several years, and that's a project mapping uh, the bathymetry of the Palau, uh, both its reef uh, areas and its uh, broader EEZ. Uh, for those of you, Palau is in the Western Pacific. It's a very small island nation uh, north of the equator. It has very uh, diverse, uh, luscious coral reefs, and uh, it's uh, very isolated from uh, terrestrial continental influences. So it's a very interesting area for any kind of coral reef work. Now, uh, Palau, the islands and reefs sit on the Palau Kyushu Ridge. Uh, this uh, left-hand photo shows the uh, EEZ and the black line. Uh, the other uh, bathymetry is uh, both a real and uh, virtually estimated bath bathymetry of the region here. The right-hand slide shows the area that had been surveyed by multi-beam sonar as of uh, about 2010. So virtually, there was virtually no uh, multi-beam coverage in, anywhere in Palau at that time. So this is our facility uh, in, in Koror. Uh, the, the vessel on the left, that's our prime summary, survey vessel, the Kemaduk. That's our staff. Uh, we're a very small operation. We are an NGO. We are not a government organization. We uh, get funding from some U.S. agencies, but uh, we're basically a an independent NGO. So this is the Kemaduk. It's a 12 meter uh, aluminum catamaran, which is, uh, we use it for a variety of things, but it's now pretty much dedicated to do multi-beam sonar mapping. Uh, we use a WASP uh, system out of New Zealand, 160 kilohertz uh, with transducer. This is a you know coastal system, uh, good to about 500 meters. Uh, we got our equipment through grant from the National Science Foundation and operating funds from the U.S. Department of Interior. This is the basic setup on the vessel. There's a, a transducer on a pole that can be rotated up and down, a console with the electronics, batteries, and a, a dedicated GPS uh, system. Uh, this is uh, Alex Ferrier, my, my co-worker. Uh, this is the transducer. Uh, we can angle that transducer up to 45 degrees uh, laterally, which helps us uh, surveying the, the, the very steep uh, walls in many of the reef areas of Palau. So that's a nice feature to have. And we also use a lot of uh, oceanographic uh, bathymetric data, mostly gathered through vessels from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography over the last decade. Uh, this is a Roger Ravel. Uh, we've had a couple of different programs. Uh, we work very closely with the uh, uh, Coastal Observing Research and Development Center out of Scripps, and then the Palau Automated Land and Resources Information System here in, in Palau po called Polaris. So this is just an example uh, on the right here shows uh, multi-beam data that was gathered by the uh, Ravel and a few other vessels <clears throat> since uh, about 2013. Uh, it's really added a lot to our knowledge of the bathymetry of the area here. And those products, uh, this is a combination of, you know, multi-beam and then other bathymetry data. Uh, it's used in a lot of oceanographic programs. Uh, this particular view is uh, Palau looking south. Uh, the land of Palau is the green. And these uh, this shows deep ocean moorings. Uh, that were set out as part of an Office of Naval Research program. But uh, so we're using the bathymetry for oceanographic work ourselves. Now, using both the, the deep ocean and our coastal bathymetry, we are producing, uh, we call them hybrid maps, uh, uh, mostly of the outer slope at the present time. <clears throat> and uh, this is an example off uh, the Peleliu Island that's about five kilometers uh, in. in dimension north to south, uh, 
and we've mapped the entire perimeter of the main Palau group, which is about 410 kilometers, linear kilometers of outer slope, uh, plus a number of the outlying reefs and islands. And this is just an oblique view of um, <clears throat> that, that same area, uh, showing just the terrain going down. Some really interesting reef features. Uh, if you look up here, you can see this is an escarpment. Same thing up here, which uh, the reef slope has cleaved away at some time in the past. And we have the uh, resultant uh, downflow of material, mostly on the deep slope here. Uh, these are features that were totally unknown uh, in, in Palau uh, until our surveys. And this is a few other examples of some, uh, some detailed maps of certain areas uh, along the outer slope and inner areas. <clears throat> so we've, we've finished the outer reef slope uh, and we are now uh, through a new grant focusing on completing the lagoon and inshore areas <clears throat> of the main Palau Reef Island group. Now for this, we're using both multi-beam, mostly our, our data that we've gathered and airborne LIDAR. Now this <clears throat> inshore and lagoon map <clears throat> mapping is, <clears throat> is not yet complete, but I can show you a few examples. Now this, uh, the red box I show here, this is a, an area inshore called uh, Nermid Bay or Nico Iwayama Bay, it's adjacent Karor. It's a very important area for coral reef research. It's a high, high acidity environment. Uh, with ocean acidification, everybody's looking at this now. Uh, it had never had any decent bathymetry done of it, but this is a multi-beam uh, of the area. A maximum depth's only 40 meters, so it took a lot of survey time to, to do the whole area with multi-beam, but we now have it done. Uh, this image, which I show here, doesn't have any of the LIDAR data added to it. However, we are adding in LIDAR for the, the shoal waters, which are not really represented. And then a second area is uh, what we call the Naruktabel Basin. It's an area with depths of 30 to 40 meters. And this was interesting because it has a, a new type of mesophotic coral reef, which had never been observed before. This is a very exciting discovery. So the bathymetry of the area has been now been mapped with multi-beam. Um, while we had to rely on side scan sonar, Side scan, side scan sonar to do the definitive mapping. So this is a detail of the area satellite image. Here's the bathymetry of that area. There are actually two World War II shipwrecks located there, which had been known, but we've got really nice imaging of them from the multi-beam. And this is a, the a side scan that's been done of the area. Uh, this is mostly done in a search for World War II U.S. aircraft down in the lagoon, but it also provided us a lot of information about benthic habitats. Uh, this is an example of some of these very strange corals that exist in this netherworld dark mesophotic reef. Another example uh, of, of what we're doing, uh, this is the area between Pelu and Angar. It's a deep water passage uh, between the, the Western Pacific and the Philippine Sea. It has a bank in the middle of it. it this is the sort of the existing bathymetry we had, virtually nothing changed since World War II. Uh, this is the, the more recent bathymetry, again, a combination of the deep ocean and the coastal bathymetry <clears throat> with Angar Island in the center there. Uh, and then the uh, shallow water bank, Hydrographer's Bank, which is up in the upper right corner, uh, gets to up to about 17 meters minimum depth. Now, one of the important things from this map is we can now uh, do slope profiles and look at tsunami risk. And it turns out that this area down in the southwest part of, uh, of Angar has a very high uh, risk of tsunamis. Uh, the slope is just a beautiful, gentle slope coming out of deep water. And actually, there are a few records of tsunamis having occurred there historically. They're fairly rare in Palau. There's another example up to the north with the North Reef Supplow, uh, Kyangal Atoll, uh, and then uh, uh, Velasco Reef. These areas, these are areas that are hit very uh, hard by the North Equatorial Current and the North Equatorial Countercurrents. And so for hydrodynamic and oceanographic work, it's really important to understand the, the, the depths of these sills and ridges in between these various features. 
And another example of how we use uh, the bathymetry in our, our sort of marine biological work, this is area here, it's on the east side of Palau. Uh, the area points to a slope where we have a, a vertical array of, of temperature logger instruments. Uh, these have been in use since uh, at the site since 1999. We now have a 23 year record every 30 minutes at all these depths of, of water temperature. Uh, it's opened up a whole world of new oceanographic questions about internal waves and, and global climate issues. Now we have had a couple of studies using virtual bathymetry and I, I just wanted to show you these to, to give you a little background what's been done here before. Uh, this one is from a NOAA publication, uh, which uh, turned out to be very inaccurate. Uh, it was just, it was based, used for a hydrodynamic model, which the hydrodynamic model is no better than the bathymetry. A more recent attempt by the Nature Conservancy uh, to do a bathymetry, virtual bathymetry based on satellite images, uh, produced a very lovely map, which is highly inaccurate. Uh, the colors, uh, the depths, the deeper depths are actually very, uh, you know, they're much deeper than what's shown in this map. The map really uh, map the uh, color of the water based on sediment load, not bathymetry. So we're a bit uh, reluctant about virtual bathymetry, particularly in areas where you have a high, high changes in high changes in water visibility, turbidity uh, with depth. As a final example, uh, on the left is a NOAA virtual <coughs> bathymetry map uh, of an area called the Sunken Village. Uh, on the right, see the actual <coughs> multi-beam of the area. Uh, there are a number of uh, submerged submarine canyons or river valleys, which are not shown in the virtual. So just a few more examples of how we use multi-beam uh, data for our studies. This is a, a, a channel between ocean and lagoon. Uh, the arrow points to a grouper spawning aggregation site. And uh, we use the base bathymetry maps to do things like mapping out <clears throat> where transects are in great detail. This gives us, of course, great information about the rugosity and, and characteristics of the communities on these bottoms. Another example, this is the uh, what we call the West Channel. It's the deepest channel between the ocean and lagoon in Palau, up to about <clears throat> 90 meters in depth. It's an extremely hydrodynamic uh, area. Uh, this is just a falling tide. Uh, we can get uh, currents up to four knots through this uh, channel on every change of the tide. 90 meters deep, 400 meters wide. <clears throat> the bathymetry of revealed some very interesting geological features. There's an interesting sill right here in mid-channel, which is probably a product of both ocean swell, which enters uh, through the opening out to the Philippine Sea and uh, the current speeds going in and out. Uh, there's the feature in a vertical view. Uh, in an area like Palau, because the water, it's warm, it's clear, where a feature like this, which is not terribly deep, uh, we can actually go check these out scuba diving to get an actual real world, world view. Uh, for deeper areas, we can send down a small ROV, but it allows us these uh, types of bathymetry mapping uh, reveals features that then we can look at in a biological or geological sense. And then finally, at this site, we have again have another vertical array <clears throat> of temperature loggers. This is interesting because of the high turbulence in this area, we get incredible mixing, uh, particularly of stratified ocean water columns coming in. Now we've done, a, there've been a few fiber optic cable mapping er efforts done. Just a few here, we'll show you what was known. We've had a uh, 2004 Shoals LIDAR survey, uh, which produced a wonderful set of maps uh, down to about 30 meters, highly detailed. Uh, they did some imaging on Velasco Reef, a sunken atoll. Uh, we can now use that LIDAR, those transects as uh, for doing uh, profiles of the atoll. And more recently, we've had two LIDAR surveys done airborne. This one was done by Fugro for UNDP. Uh, we're now using that data combined with our multi-beam data to produce uh, more detailed maps. As an example of the LIDAR data, this is a very shallow reef area. 
uh, allows us to cover large areas quickly. And the Southwest Islands of Palau, there are five oceanic islands. We've also mapped those, again, a combination of coastal and deep ocean. Uh, we also have the new Fugro LIDAR from those. And then finally, uh, a single atoll down to the south of Palau Helen Reef. Uh, the outer slope has been done by multi-beam from the Ravel. And uh, we are now having a, a, a virtual bathymetry done of the, the entire atoll, which is about 20 kilometers long. Now we're planning a uh, products of bathymetric atlas of Palau. This will include about uh, 78 maps of the outer slope. Uh, these are this is an example of a couple of pages. The right-hand page will have a, a contour chart vertical. Uh, the left-hand page will have oblique views and then information about that particular site. Finally, a few of our outreach efforts. Uh, we've produced uh, maps for all the 16 states of Palau with their outer slopes for their, their state governments. And then we also have a training program with the community college to, uh, to take students out for actual experience at sea. So that's it. Thank you. Palau is a small place with a big ocean, and we're making progress one day at a time. Thank you. Hope somebody's there. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Patrick. That was fantastic. Um, some of those maps are absolutely brilliant. Um, and it's great to see the shallow bathymetry, um, you know, really coming along. It's really, really impressive. Um, I think unless we have any pressing questions, we'll just move straight on to the next talk um, in the interest of time. Um, so if we have um, Yukari Kido, uh, if you're online and want to share your screen, um, Yukari from Jamstech and is going to talk, uh, talk to us about ocean mapping and activities um, that Jamstech have been up to. Thank you, Brooke. Can you hear my voice? Yes, we can hear you. OK, so I'll try to share my screen. Uh, just a moment, please. Can you? Oh, is it OK? Yeah, we've got your slides now, so we're OK. Ready. Thank you very much and good morning and good afternoon and good evening over the world. This is Yukari Kido from Jamstack. I'm belonging to Mathematical Seafloor Geomorphology Project Team. That is a kind of a interdisciplinary project. Researchers, technicians from various fields of expertise inside the Jamstack. So I briefly introduce our recent activities and the machine learning approaches, data contribution and collaboration. Uh, the map of the uh, sorry figure, right side figure, mathematical seafloor geomorphology is a brochure uh, last summer published, and please check and visit our website. And the next uh, update activities since last uh, this uh, regional community meeting, uh, international affairs, we joined the Jevco Map the Gap meeting and the Cyber 2030 One Ocean Summit and the crowdsource basimetry working group 12 and also contribute to Jevco grid creating. And the next domestic networking uh, already had from Hyo Japan Coastal Guard Hydrological Agency uh, mentioned. Uh, we have an uh, email contact and online meeting several times and the joint research MOU signed with the JCG, JODC and the JAMSTEC the uh, end of May this year. So we will continue to do some collaborative work. And under planning to programming it, uh, we did uh, uh, some uh, vulnerability check of our database site. I'm very, very sorry for these years. Uh, we could not open for general public of our Darwin database site 
but uh, now vulnerability check almost done and the prototype database new database site construction has been done so hopefully we will open to the general public soon <laughs> and the next the publications Mitsuko Hidaka et al. Um, Geoinformatics. That is a paper I will briefly introduce the next slide. And that paper got a best paper award of this year. And the Taku Yutani et al. Uh, he is also doing some uh, super uh, high resolution mapping and published in sensors in recent May of 2022. And the presentation has been done, JPGU 2021, join forum and the website update and the new brochure has been uh, published. So the first, I will introduce some uh, two papers. One is for Mitsuko Hidaka et al, super resolution for ocean bathymetric maps using deep learning approaches uh, published in Geoinformatics Volume 32, number 1, 2021. So this is a um, uh, deep learning approach for super resolution. The right side, left side, is a training data set. For example, research vessels. We have uh, several research vessels. Uh, this is Yokosuka, uh, research vessel Mirai, and the Natsushima. So uh, we accumulated and gathered seven cruises, Mirai 2 and the Natsushima and the Yokosuma, Yokosuka 3 cruises and the total seven uh, since 2013 to 2015 to create a, a marginal beams data set at the Okinawa Trough. Uh, this area selection is because of the, it has been surveyed extensively, has a large amount of data, and uh, is ratched and varied from flats to nodes. So this is a good area to have some test and uh, deep learning approaching. And the deep learning architectures, uh, these are five methods we uh, tried to use. We have uh, trialed super resolution techniques for this uh, ocean bathymetry using deep learning approaches and uh, reveal the potency of these methods. But uh, please don't ask me more detail because I don't know <laughs> in detail. So this is Mitsuko Hidaka's work, mainly her activities. But the five deep learning super resolution architectures were applied to task to generate uh, from a 100 meter interval and 50 meter interval gridding ocean bathymetric map. The results obtained by each architecture and uh, interpolated by the bicubic method were evaluated. So next slide I showed, uh, yeah, so she could do the comparison and the validation of these uh, uh, SCSR neural network and uh, further neural network technique and enhanced uh, neural network technique and the CR GAN technique and these five methods are applied. And the uh, left side is low, re resist low resolution data and the bicubic method and the right side is high resolution maps. So we applied this deep learning method. So uh, deep learning methods and the models uh, outperformed by cubic interpolation, but the highest accuracy is not always provided by the same model. Yeah, I will try to enlargement of this figure. For example, uh, in the case of ESR GAN, so for this, these lines. A model effective, especially when the depth difference is big or a geography is large. When geography is more gradual, simple neural network models provide better accuracy. So she will try to 
compare the so many cases using an index of the root mean square error for the for her methods. This the success or failure of training and uh, performance of the model in super resolution can be evaluated by indexing the closeness of the high resolution output to the corresponding correct images. So I think uh, this work, so inspired by her achievements, a following works methods are developed. Therefore, her paper gets an award, I guess. And the next paper, I will show you some uh, from Yutani, Taku Yutani et al. in the sensors paper, super resolution and the future extraction for ocean bathymetric maps using sparse coding. This is another way to approach to fill the gap of the maps. So uh, upper chart is a flow chart of the outline of uh, super resolution. Uh, sparse coding. In this study, uh, we modify the super resolution technique based on dictionary learning and the sparse coding. So we call the SCSR, that is a sparse coding and the dictionary learning method, and applied it to seafloor topographic maps. This is in the same area called Mitsuko did the previous paper, uh, Ocean, uh, Okinawa Trough, and using the same input data, mar uh, marginal beams from Okinawa Trough. And uh, this red line, red line area, we pr uh, provide eight uh, areas. And then training data set by training, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, as an improvement of the conventional method, the pre processing of separating the teacher image into the low frequency component, which has the general structure, and the high frequency component, which captures the detailed topogra topographical features is carried out before dictionary learning. So right side of hand is a training data set. Uh, we tried to extract several characteristics of the seafloor topography. And this is the result of deep learning approaches for super resolution. This figures uh, left side and right side is residual images between the super resolution images and the original images of the area uh, 02. 02 is here. And we can find SCSR method. Uh, the left, left side is SCSR method. Root mean square error is 1.156 meter. And uh, by cubic interpolation, that is 1.1713 meter. So the same color scale is used in both images. So uh, you can see this table. Upper side is the SCSR method and by cubic. So each area shows uh, more accurate and the root mean square error, the lower of the SCSR is approximately 30% lower than that of bicubic interpolation. This is his paper, the result. And still, there are many pros and cons of each method. So we will try to improve this method and try to uh, overall Japanese area and Japan. This is only a uh, Okinawa trough, but try to other subduction zone and active margin and the basement area. So we will try to do some uh, works. And also we have a survey area by AUV and ROV to do some check and uh, actual topographical features obtained. So that is two papers. Sorry for my 
uh, very short uh, guidance, but the, this is a two papers introduction. And the next one, our JAMSTEC uh, uh, database site we call Darwin for general public uh, database site. So this is as of 18 March, a little bit uh, uh, old data, but uh, I'm very sorry for this Darwin site. It's a bit uh, old and uh, now a new database site is being built. So this Darwin site functions are very outdated and old and do not have the latest security measures. So we will try to update and uh, hopefully to open for general public um, in not so later within this summer or March, uh, for them, autumn. So uh, these are the data, including the database site, cruises and dives and to more than 2,377 dives, observation data, uh, totally this number, and the marine geophysics data, including bathymetry data of 1,270 cruises, gravity and the magnetics are also uh, including this database site. And uh, I'm sure to provide all of you uh, offline. And please let me know if you need the data set around the Japan and uh, using our research vessels. Uh, I'm happy to provide you. And actually providing last year's, uh, to, since last year's to Niva and Ramont. And the next step of mathematical shift for the team. This is a plan of this fiscal year. Uh, we will uh, attend this meeting and the crowdsource bathymetry working group and the JBCO grid try to uh, contribute for the next generation. And the domestic network already Harukasa mentioned, but we have a planning to grid the project with the JCG, JODC to JAMSTEC. And the database open access will be soon to uh, hopefully. And the publications uh, will provide uh, available for deep learning related papers and the sparse modeling also uh, preparing for Matsuoka and Kuwata at all. And the presentation will plan to AGU, JPGU, GeoInforum, and the website the brochure updating. Thank you very much for your listening. And this is updating since last year. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Yukari. Um, yes, again, in much. the interest of time, I think we might move on to Kevin's talk and then if people have questions for any of the speakers, maybe um, we can um, get, have questions for all of the speakers after Kevin's talk. So uh, Kevin, if you want to share your screen and we'll move on. Yes, thank you. Cheers. Well, thank you, Kari. That was a very interesting talk. Um, thank you very much again, and thank you, Jamstick, for your continued contribution to CV2030. So um, this is the last presentation for today, uh, and, and it's a presentation on a project that CB2030 um, is sponsoring. Um, it's called the Niwa Nippon Foundation Tonga Eruption Seabed Mapping Project, or Test Map. Um, and, and what this project stemmed about was from a volcanic eruption that happened in Tonga on January the 15th this year. Um, and this is a, a copy of the, the cover of the latest um, edition of the Science Magazine for July this year. And it literally was the undersea explosion that was heard around the world. Sorry. Now this should auto start this video. Right, so um, this volcano has a very interesting history. It first erupted in 2015, and it surprised everybody when it popped out of the ocean and created the world's um, youngest island at the time. Um, and by the end of the year, um, the, the volcano had joined on to two older islands, 
We can see in the photo there's Honga Hapai, which is the island in the foreground, and Honga Tonga, which is the island in the background. And, and collectively, this created a single volcano called Honga Tonga Honga Harapai. Uh, by 2016, this volcano had um, well established itself as a larger island, and, and serendipitously, the Falcor was surveying and the nearby Lao Basin looking for hydrothermal vent. Um, uh, vent biology systems and on the way to Tongatapu, it did um, a survey around the island and actually gave us a very good bathymetric map um, of the sea floor before the January the 15th of the eruption and we're very lucky to have that um, data from the foul core. In December 2021, um, the volcano started erupting again uh, and it erupted from December through to January 15th of increasingly um, more violent eruptions. This particular video image is taken on January the 14th, uh, so it's 24 hours before um, it went um, in its super explosion. And by uh, December, uh, sorry, January the 14th, the um, volcano itself had grown to 120 meters high. So it was 120 meters high uh, above the sea floor. It was a subaerial volcano, but after a big explosion um, on, on the night of uh, January the 14th. Um, this volcano actually blew its top and created an underwater volcano. Now this eruption wasn't the big one, but it did create an underwater volcano. So here's um, some aerial imagery. Um, you can see the size of the volcano on January the 7th on the top left. And you can see uh, a satellite imagery taken on the morning of January the 15th um, that the volcano had blown up and that was that eruption we saw in the video um, and put the vent underwater. And by putting the vent underwater, it set up um, effectively the perfect storm of conditions to create um, this. This was uh, the world's largest uh, atmospheric eruption, uh, atmospheric explosion ever recorded. Um, it's also generated the world's highest uh, volcanic plume ever recorded. The shock wave, which you can quite clearly see in the video, was so strong and so powerful that not only did it reverberate around the world three times, but it literally moved clouds over the UK. And the noise generated was so loud that um, even here in Wellington, we could quite clearly hear the bang uh, from several thousand miles away. It is the um, largest event, volcanic event, uh, effectively to happen since Krakatoa uh, in terms of the size of the explosion and, and certainly arguably the, the amount of material erupted. And its effects on, the, on nearby Tonga were um, devastating. Uh, there were three deaths on Tonga itself uh, and a further three deaths happened um, in South America, so six deaths in total. But in terms of Tonga, 80% of its population was directly impacted by the eruption and its tsunami. Um, underwater communication cables were cut, not only between international, um, but even to the outer islands. Uh, there was no communications whatsoever. Crops, livestock, freshwater supplies and fisheries were badly affected and still are badly affected. And about $90 million of damages, which is nearly 20% of Tonga's GDP. Uh, and damages. So for a small country like Tonga that also happened to be suffering through uh, COVID pandemic, um, this was truly a devastating um, result. And uh, the Nippon Foundation um, and Mr. Sasagawa, the chairman of the Nippon Foundation, has always had a strong tie with Tonga um, through his family um, and he's always felt uh, a strong affinity to the Tonga. So they were really looking through CB2030 as trying to work out a best way to respond uh, to this eruption um, and the effects on the Tongan people. And at the same time, Niwa was also um, doing similar sort of thoughts about how best to respond and really understand how this volcano affected the ocean and the seafloor around it. So, um, so what was generated um, was the, Nippon, the Niwa Nippon Foundation Tonga Eruption uh, mapping project, test map, um, in conjunction with CB2030. And its job was to basically have three three processes, three parts to it. Number one was to understand the effects on the seafloor through seafloor mapping. 
but it also needed to understand the um, impacts, the geological and, and ecological impacts on the seafloor and life on the seafloor. And it also wanted to understand geological, um, sorry, the, the ocean biogeochemical impacts on the, on the oceans around it as well. And so to start with the planning of the, this particular project um, that was done on the RV Tangaroa, um, we first used the uh, Jebco 2021 grid to really anal and look at the C4 around Tonga. Uh, and on this uh, GIS analysis, we overlaid um, the cable routes, which are the lines in white, and plotted um, the cable breaks where the cables are broken. And we calculated that the area of seafloor that has been changed because of the eruption is highlighted there in, in the black dashed line, which is about um, nearly 60 kilometer radius. So at, a, at, a, at one event, we effectively removed 8,000 square kilometers of our previous knowledge of the seafloor. Uh, everything we thought we knew potentially um, is, is gone. We have to basically start from scratch. So the project started um, as a 28 day voyage on the Tungara that left Wellington. Um, and we used a multiple of sensors uh, and equipment to really understand not only the um, seafloor mapping and, and identify the changes in the seafloor mapping, but we also did um, towed camera arrays and sediment grabs um, and uh, other sorts of scientific equipment uh, through the ocean column to really understand the effects that this eruption has. Uh, but what I'm going to really concentrate on is the effects on the seafloor and, and what the seafloor mapping showed in terms of what happened on that massive eruption and the potential long term effects um, that changes in the seafloor uh, will have on the ocean. So this is the map that we uh, um, acquired during our survey. Uh, in this particular area, we met 4,000 square kilometres of seafloor using an EM302 30 kilohertz multi echo sounder. Our primary areas we really concentrated on was uh, the area around Honga Tonga Honga Apai volcano itself, but we also really wanted to understand what happened on the seafloor that caused the international cable shown here in this brown line running east to west. Why did that break? Uh, and also, why did the domestic communications cable running here north-south, why did that break? If we look in at the volcano itself, uh, we had the advantage of the 2016 data from the Falcor, um, but when we compared, just visually compared, the bathymetry that we mapped in 2022 versus what the Falcor mapped, at first glance, we didn't see any evidence or very little evidence of a violent eruption. The seafloor bathymetry uh, appeared to look very much the same as what it did in 2016. So all those ridges and lumps and bumps and knolls that you see on this 2022 map still existed in 2016. So that was our first, you know, curious moment about, well, we knew the eruption was violent, uh, but we don't see the evidence on the sea floor. So we're not terribly sure what was going on. What we did see clearly in the 2022 data was uh, these channels that indicate um, very turbulent pyroclastic density flows had eroded their way down the sides of the volcanoes. And we also observed very large sediment waves running offshore into the deeper Lao Basin. And these sediment waves are several um, hundred meters in wavelength and tens and tens of meters high. And it's also important to note that the Tongara didn't actually go over the top of the volcano itself. This was a, at the time, um, felt the safest thing to do because we weren't terribly sure whether the volcano had finished erupting and uh, undersea volcanic eruptions and big steel boats don't really go well together. So this is an important part of the test map project because this follows in very nicely with part two, which is where we will fill in this particular hole with an uncrewed surface vessel from SeaKit. Uh, and we'll talk about the SeaKit mission a bit later. But what the 2016 data from the um, Falco did show us and it did allow us to do is to, we allowed us to subtract the seafloor height, the bathymetry from, from the Tungara from the Falcor data and generate a difference map. That is, let's highlight the areas where seafloor has been eroded away and seafloor has been added. 
And this seafloor map shows in the blue is places where seafloor has been removed by the eruption, and in red is where seafloor is being added. And we, when we calculate the sums um, of the differences between the Falcor data and the Tungaroa data, the volumes of material involved are, are, are staggering. In terms of the blue, in terms of the area removed, we're seeing uh, up to three cubic kilometers of material has been eroded away because of the eruption. But in terms of the red, the area added, we're seeing up to seven cubic kilometers of new material has been added onto the seafloor. And that's just in this particular area around the volcano itself. If you extrapolate that out to the larger black dash circle, we're talking about 10 cubic kilometers of new material approximately have been um, added because of this eruption. And to put things into context, the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption um, that devastated Washington State uh, was only one cubic kilometre, and, and the volcano eru volcanic eruption that destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum uh, in AD 79 uh, was only 0.8 of a cubic kilometre. So we're talking about vast amounts of materials flying down the, along the sea floor from this eruption and, and devastating um, all life. So it's not only changed the sea floor map, um, it's also damaged and destroyed complete ecosystems as these uh, eruptive flows followed along the sea floor. So just in terms of um, the end of part one, which is the Tungaroa part of the test map project, um, for CB 2030 we mapped 22,000 square kilometres of sea floor, of which 13,000 were mapped the gaps. Um, we deliberately targeted the transit routes and, and, and the planning routes to get gaps in the CB20 and the JIPCO grid. Um, and, and the main take homes is that um, while the edifice itself is still intact, uh, large volumes of material were involved in the eruption. And in terms of the underwater cables, um, the reason why the underwater cables were, were broken is because they've been buried by up to 30 metres of volcanic debris. And when you consider that these cables are 60 kilometres away from the volcano, it really shows uh, how massive this eruption really was. Greetings everyone from the team here at Seagate International. I'm very excited to be giving you this mission update from our remote operating centre, or the ROC as we refer to it. Our uncrewed surface vessel Maxima will be controlled from here, over 16,000 kilometres away in Essex in the UK, as she completes the second phase of the uh, Tonga project. Here you can see just how much information we have at the operator's fingertips to ensure safe and informed navigational and operational decisions. The data being gathered from the mission will come through here and be streamed out to hydrographers and scientists around the world. We are tracking Max Lima over here and she is currently in Singapore awaiting the next transit to Fiji where she will make her final trip to nuclear offer for mobilisation in June by the CKIT team. Thanks to the efforts of Tangarella we have been able to develop the planning of phase two and will be able to focus on filling the gaps in the Caldera survey and around internal and external cable routes that have been damaged. Max Lima will also use an innovative winch and sensor deployment capability to map where there is new volcanic activity. So I look forward to giving you further updates in the coming months from the rock here. Goodbye for now. Yeah, so that was uh, Ben from CKIT talking about phase two. Just as a clarification, um, right now the CKIT is now in Tonga. It has been unloaded uh, out of its container and we expect it to be on the water and start its mission over the Cordera uh, within the next week or two. And that uh, basically concludes my talk about the Tonga eruption mapping program. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Kevin. That was great. Uh, does anyone have any questions for, for Kevin, first of all? Um, if you do, just uh, drop them in the chat or raise your hand or, or just turn your microphone on. Stunned silence. Right, thanks, Brooke. Thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll just do a signing off. Um, so before everyone goes, can I get everybody to turn? Oh, Stuart Kai. We got one question here. Sorry, sorry, Kevin. I was just going to ask. Um, the CCATs can be streamed live. They said, where, where's that going to be available? 
So that will be live to the um, the the multi like the multi operators and and the um, pilot will have it live. Now there is a limited bandwidth, so we have debated internally about whether or not we can make that link publicly available. And I think our decision is that we will not do that because um, because of the because of the bandwidth we have from Tonga is not that high. We don't want 500 people trying to log in at the same time to see what's going on. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, that's that, that's fine. And is it going to be recorded or kind of progress reports made and, and presented? Where, where, where will that be available? That's a good question. So we will there definitely be uh, progress reports done weekly, uh, but you have raised a good point. I think I should suggest to the project team that we should have a like a little web page um, update. I know there's certainly going to be a blog happening online, um, but I'll make sure that I'll distribute that uh, link. Actually, it's a good idea. I'll distribute that link to the community actually, so they can tap in and see how progress goes on. That's that's a good point. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, hi, I got your hand up. Question is, what do the local think of this? Is there a lot of immunity required to survey? Yes, that's a question for Pat. I don't know, Pat, can you see the chat question? Yeah, let me just uh, pull it up here. Is that the question about? Hang on. About what the locals think of this mapping? Yes, I, I could. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't really hear. Uh, I guess it's Jody. Um, actually, uh, local Palauans have been very enthusiastic. Uh, you know, Palau is a very small place. Uh, in a certain sense, it's not very traditional. Uh, people aren't, you know, uh, running people off of their reefs or anything because you're in their their territory. So, uh, you know, the, people have accepted this well. They they actually encourage us to do this. And, uh, you know, when we gave the maps out to all the state governors, I mean, the, the states, some of them have 100 or 200 people. So they're very small communities and, and everybody's been enthusiastic about it. So, uh, you know, it, it could be very different in other countries uh, that I've been familiar with. But here in Palau, it's uh, they're used to people doing research and looking at MPAs and all this sort of thing. So it was uh, very well accepted. Fortunately. Great answer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, no great answer. And, and, but there is, a, there is a greater question there, especially in the Pacific, where um, we really have to be mindful of uh, the indigenous people and the locals. Uh, we can't just assume as scientists or, or whatever to go in there and, and survey in, in somebody's local area without consultation. And I know that's really key um, for, for our, our success in the Pacific is consultation with the locals. Yeah, you know, we spent a number of years in Papua New Guinea. We've worked in uh, places like Chuuk, which are very protective of, and uh, compartmentalized in terms of their communities. And so, yeah, we're very aware of this. But Palau is sort of an exception in many regards, and that's one of them. Yeah, that, that's right. Thanks, Pat. And we've got another question for me uh, about the question is how does ocean mapping but how can ocean mapping help the government and local community in Tonga recover? So it does two ways that we can do this. The first is uh, really understanding um, the tsunami modeling, uh, because without a good mapping of the sea floor, uh, we didn't, um, it's very hard to predict the effects of the tsunami. And, and one of the big surprises from this eruption was the tsunami itself. No one expected it. Uh, there was never any planning for it. And while Tonga does have uh, a very good tsunami alert system. Uh, it was never active and never put on standby because as scientists or as, as humans, we never thought that there'd be a risk of a tsunami from this sort of eruption. So in terms of a modeling point of view, the mapping can directly contribute to an improvement in the um, tsunami forecasting as well as the ocean currents. Uh, one of the things that the, the the volcano did is it did distribute vast amounts of ash through the water column and around the water. 
and that ash um, initially can be toxic and without understanding the effects of the ocean currents um, which are driven and which are controlled by the bathymetry it's very hard to then monitor the effects of this toxicity within the ash so there's the motion current point of view but our biggest uh, outcome to the Tongan people through the project was actually through the effects of the camera work and sampling that, that allows us to start um, looking at the ecosystems uh, and how they're affected, um, especially with their deep sea fishing industry uh, that was being strongly affected by the eruption. So the, there is direct um, outcomes that can help the locals and the governments, but the long-term monitoring and the baseline that we've established, I think will be the biggest benefit to the locals uh, in terms of the recovery from Tonga. Any other questions? Great, so I think it's photo time now. Can we get everybody to turn your cameras on, please? Uh, and we'll take a group photo. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank All right, you. thank you everybody. And thank you all for your um, uh, participation and I look forward to seeing you all this time tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.